My name's Toby Hanfield, and this is the first of a series of videos in which I'm going to try to explain some of the basic ideas of social choice theory, and in particular, Arrow's theorem, arguably the most famous and important result in social choice theory. First, some, basic, some of the basic notation and concepts we'll be using to explain these ideas. A voting procedure can be understood as effectively a type of mathematical function. All that means is we can understand it as a well-defined input-output procedure. What are the inputs? The inputs are first some options that you are voting on, right? some options that you need to decide between. Second, you need some voters. And third, you need the preferences of the voters over the options. So if we were being really, really exhaustive about noting everything that goes into a social choice function, or some sort of voting procedure, I would explicitly list first all the options, then I'd list all the voters, and then I'd list all the preferences that the voters have. But notice, because the preferences are preferences of voters over the options, usually you can sort of reconstruct what the voters and the options are just from the preferences alone. So often, I will just resort to only mentioning the preferences and assume you can infer what I meant the options and the voters were. Usually, I'll refer to the options with Roman letters like A, B, and C. Some writers like to use X, Y, and Z. The voters, it t tends not to be terribly important to label them because it's rare that we actually want to label all of them, whereas you definitely usually do want to label all of the options that are being voted on. One thing is we'll usually assume that there is a total number of them, N. And so given that there's a total number N, you can quite easily sort of note the voters as voter 1, 2, 3, and so on, all the way up to N. Uh, but also you could say, you could give them names, right? So sometimes we talk about, you know, Alf, Betty, Charlie, and so on. Uh, though that can get confusing if you're coming up with your own examples having capital letters that are the same as your options. The preferences of voters are a little more complex. We need to take our time thinking about ways to represent these. At its most basic, if I was being really sort of thorough and not wanting to use the convenience of notation at all, I could say voter 1 prefers A over B and prefers B over C and prefers A over C. For our three options, A and B and C, that would be an exhaustive way of recording the preferences of voter 1. But it's a bit cumbersome to do that every time. So one convenient uh, technique is to use the greater than sign, or sometimes you'll see a slightly fancier version, which is the earlier than sign, uh, which is this sort of curvy version of the greater than symbol, to indicate preference. So if I write down A is better than B, like this, I have quickly conveyed the information of preferring A over B. Another way I could try to represent preferences is not to talk about individual pairs like this, but try to construct an overall list, like 1, A, 2, B, 3, C. Or I could do the same sort of thing, but without the numbers. I could just do A, B, C, and sort of use the vertical structure on the page to indicate the relative ranking in the preference order. Notice that when I did it in the explicit method, I mentioned A prefers, uh, the, the, the voter prefers A over C. Whereas here, I don't actually 
ever say anything about C directly. Right? It's sort of something you infer as well. A is high up and C is lower down, so presumably, though I've not drawn a line between A and C, there is a preference relation between A and C like this. Now that is something generally safe to infer, assuming that the preferences the voter has are transitive. Transitivity means whenever it's the case that you have a preference between two things like this and another two things like that, A and B and then B and C, then you can fill in the preference that sort of jumps over the A over C preference. It goes in the same direction. Somebody who violates transitivity could be in the very strange state of preferring A over B. I'll do arrows here now to show the direction of the preference ratio. A over B, B over C, but because they violate transitivity, they actually prefer C over A. And such a person is said to have cyclic or cyclic or cyclical preferences. And usually that's thought to be a pretty serious sign of being an irrational agent because it's no longer clear what it is to achieve your goals given that you don't have any clear best option, not even a tie for best. Every single option is beaten by something else. Now, for our purposes, we're almost always going to assume that voters are perfectly rational, therefore no one has cyclical preferences, and indeed they all have transitive preference orderings. And in that case, you can use representations like the one we had before, A, B, C, and you can omit having to write out explicitly A, C like that. You could simply write A, B, this is another way you could do it, A, B, C. And because we're assuming transitivity, we kind of fill in the A better than C relation. Or using numbers, A is above B is above C implies that A is preferred to C. So in general, it's not a big problem for us, for individual voters, to assume transitivity. Now it turns out, on some voting procedures, the outcome of the vote may not respect transitivity. So that's why we have to get a bit more fussy about this issue of how we represent the outcome of voting when we're particularly thinking about the outcome of a possible hypothetical voting procedure. Okay, now notice when I was talking about preferences here, I was only talking about prefers, outright prefers, but sometimes we have ties in how, how we feel about something, right? We think these two things are equally good. How do we represent that? Well, people talk about the relationship of being indifferent between two things when you have no preference either way. And the symbol people use for that, they don't, we don't use the equal sign because that's usually reserved just for numbers where there's strict equality. And here we're not talking about, not saying that policies A and B are equal, it's just that you don't prefer one over the other. And so you'll see this usually represented with a tilde sign like that, sometimes with a sign like this, and sometimes even with a sign like this, and sometimes with three bars. I will tend to stick to this one. But any of those, if you see them in readings, could mean the same thing. One last thing you need to be aware of, again, just for reading elsewhere, we won't particularly need it, is the, um, the notion of weakly preferring one thing over another. So this is sort of where you, we're not yet specifying, is it the case that a person, so that here are two options, could be they think A is better than B, or it could be they think A and B, they're indifferent between them. What if we don't want to commit? We're saying they have either of these states of mind. Well, then we say they weakly prefer it. They think that A is at least as good as B and possibly better. And this tends to get represented with a greater than an e or equal to sign or an equivalent with that fancier um, symbol with the curvy greater than sign that I indicated before. Not that easy to tell with my handwriting the difference, but the idea is that this curves in to a point. And sometimes they, the second bar will be just a flat line. Sometimes it will be sort of mirroring the original curve like so. Okay. Uh, why would you ever use the weekly preferring uh, method? Well, it's convenient for some people using more mathematical approaches because it turns out you can define the indifference relation in terms of that one, and you can define the strictly preferring relation in terms of this one. So here's the idea. A is indifferent to B just means the same thing as 
A is weakly preferred to B and B is weakly preferred to A. And A is strictly better than B can be defined as A is weakly preferred to B and B is not weakly preferred to A. That's just a convenience that's never actually any convenient for us, but could be convenient for some sorts of theorists who want to try and reduce the number of basic relations to the smallest number possible. It's, it's annoying to them to have this and this as two fundamental relations. They'd rather get by with just that and the not relation, which we have over here. Okay. Finally, Remember I was saying that we need to distinguish different voters, different options, and the preferences of the voters. How do we tell, if we're writing it down, let's say we've got two voters, uh, we'll call them Susie and Rob, and I want to say Susie prefers A over B, but Rob prefers B over A. Um, how might we indicate that in our notation? Well, sometimes you'll see people subscript the relationship by the particular voter. That would be one way to do it. Usually, it'll be completely unambiguous from the context in which we're doing it that we can leave that out. But that is, strictly speaking, one thing you could do. In effect, think of it as this way. This symbol, the greater than symbol subscripted with S, is Susie's preference relation. And Rob's preference relation is a different thing, because Rob, has, Rob doesn't have to prefer in the same way as anyone else. So that's why you might have two different um, uh, the symbols for two different voters, and you can keep going with all of your voters. Finally, remember, so we've got this, this function, which is our voting procedure, and you can just think of that like this black box. You feed in the preferences, and you get out, well, there's two possible things you can get out. It could just be you get a winner, a single option, ideally, or it could be a couple that are tied but it's not really going to tell you anything about the losers and how relatively they did. Or you could get a complete ranking. Okay, So you're going to get one, two, three, and so on, a ranking of all of the options. If the function only out tries to output a winner, that is known as a collective choice rule or a CCR. If it outputs a ranking, it's known as a social welfare function, or an SWF. Now, whichever one, let, let's focus for the moment on a social welfare function, because what a social welfare function is doing is it's trying to come up with something quite similar to the individual preferences, but remember these are lots and lots of preferences for different voters, Susie, Rob, and so on. And it's going to output a single preference ranking that is something like the collective preference ranking. So you could just use the greater than symbol for the, the collective ranking as well, the very same symbol. Some writers though, because they really want to make clear that this is a very different thing, that the outcome of your voting procedure, they use a capital letter P to indicate strictly preferred by the, the collective choice. Right? So they might write X, P, Y to mean in the collective ranking it's the same as the individual attitude of thinking X is strictly better than Y. Uh, they might use I to mean indifference, right? to mean that they're tied in the social ranking, and they might use R for that weak uh, preference relation of either they're tied or X is preferred. I will generally avoid using the PIR uh, notation. I will just try to get by with a single greater than sign, but try to make it clear on any given occasion whether I'm talking about individual or collective preferences. Finally, you might say, why get so fussy with all this? Why are we putting this time into the not notation? It's important to stress that you are probably familiar with a few ways of holding a vote. Um, you might know about the particular method used in the Australian uh, federal elections for the House of Representatives. You probably don't fully understand the method used in the uh, elections for the Senate, which are rather complicated in Australia. Um, but you probably have at least, hopefully, the, the broad outlines of the idea. 
you probably have, particularly following recent uh, events, a reasonably good understanding of the American presidential electoral system. When we're trying to make claims about what's good or bad or disappointing or uh, frustrating about any given voting system, one of the things that we uh, would like to do is to make very general claims. So if, for instance, I try to make an argument that um, system X has um, a bad feature, F, That's fine as far as it goes. I might be able to prove that the Australian system, for instance, has this particular bad feature F. But what we'd like to know is, what about, what's the range of possible systems we could have, right? Is it the case that all possible systems have F, even ones that we haven't imagined yet, haven't tried out? Could we use mathematical techniques to make proofs about such claims? And indeed, that's what we can. That's really the a great achievement of social choice theory to show you can prove, for instance, that there are certain attractive features which are impossible to have together. So every single actual social choice rule must be in some sense imperfect because it won't have all of the features that you might have thought are important.